Well, thank you for coming, and um, just like to take a minute to say thank you for the invitation, especially thank you to Peter for his hospitality since I've been here. Um, so today, I'm going to, um, as Peter mentioned, uh, take you through the work um, uh, that's been going on in my laboratory over the past uh, almost 15 years now. Um, but first, I'm going to start with a bit of background on HIV and uh, then take you into um, uh, the world of HIV-NEF protein, where our focus has been on understanding how NEF uh, promotes HIV immune evasion by disrupting antigen presentation. And, um, we've made some recent advances on understanding the molecular mechanism. And then next, I'm going to tell you a story about VIF and VPR, two other HIV accessory proteins, and tell you a recent story about how these two overcome intrinsic antiviral responses and modulate the natural killer cell response against HIV. And then finally, I'm going to just present a couple of slides at the end um, uh, on our recent studies describing HIV latent reservoirs in hematopoietic progenitor cells. And I'm only providing a few slides on this because I'm going to go into it in much more detail in a second talk I'm giving today um, at 4.30 in one of the sessions. So um, as you all know, HIV continues to be a pandemic virus. Um, the numbers in 2011 were 34 million people living with HIV, including 3.3 million children. And there were 2.5 million new infections, including um, and also 1.7 million deaths. And um, an important statistic is that over the next decade or so, most of the 34 million people currently living with HIV will require treatment but likely only half of these people will have access to them. And one of the problems in providing adequate therapy to all the people who are infected is that people require lifelong therapy. Um, these drugs do not provide a cure, and termination of treatment at any stage of therapy leads to viral rebound and disease progression. So it's a fairly awesome task to um, treat the global pandemic. Um, but there are reasons for optimism. There's a handful of people who have either been cured or are in a very sustained remission. And I'm sure many of you have seen the news reports on these individuals. Um, there is one uh, termed the Berlin patient. Um, this is an American man who in Germany underwent an allogeneic bone marrow transplant for leukemia. And after the transplant, his HIV appears to be gone. Um, and then there was, earlier this year, an infected newborn who was rapidly uh, treated with drugs after uh, she was born and appears to either be cured or, again, in a very sustained remission off therapy. And then most recently, there have been some news reports of two patients um, in Boston uh, uh, and uh, these two individuals appear to have some promising results after allogeneic bone marrow transplant. So th these cases give us optimism that there is a path to a cure. Each of these individuals is also very unique, and it's likely to be very difficult to translate the mechanism by which they were cured or put in remission to the more general population. And I just want to underline the fact that allogeneic bone marrow transplant comes with a 30% associated mortality and is, is not a good way of treating a disease that can be um, adequately treated with um, oral medication. And so, but, but we need to use these, these cases as a way to uh, better understand what was effective about the treatments they received and perhaps come up with a more tolerable regimen that we could apply to the general population. If a short course treatment was available, obviously that would transform the global uh, pandemic and um, allow really meaningful inroads towards eradicating the disease.
Okay, so my laboratory really studies molecular mechanisms because uh, we believe that if we truly understand how the virus is working, that we could um, have a, a better way to come up with some novel therapies. And in particular, we're interested in how the virus interacts with the immune response and why HIV is able to consistently establish a persistent infection um, that inexorably leads to disease in all infected people. In many uh, types of viral infections, cytotoxic T lymphocytes are really important for controlling the virus. And there are anti-HIV CTLs that can be isolated from HIV-infected people. Um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes express the CD8 molecule and a T cell receptor, which rec recognizes a peptide antigen presented in association with host MHC class 1 molecules. And when a, a foreign peptide antigen is presented by host MHC, the CD8 killer T cell releases perforins and granzymes that lead to the lysis of the infected cell. Because anti-HIV CTLs do not eradicate HIV infected cells, though they seem to have an impact on viral loads and may delay disease progression, nevertheless, they fail to um, uh, contain the disease and they fail to eradicate it. So we hypothesize that HIV might encode a gene product that uh, counteracted the ability of CTLs to recognize and kill infected cells. Here's a schematic diagram of the HIV genome. It's a relatively simple virus encoding a small number of genes, which I divide up into those required for virus production, which include GAG, POL, OMF, TAT, and REV, and those that I term accessory because they're not required for viral particle production in many cell line systems. And these accessory genes, VPR, VPU, VIF, and NEF, are required in vivo for high viral loads and for disease progression. And so these genes are really good candidates for HIV uh, factors that might play a role in counteracting the immune response. So we did a simple experiment um, to test whether any of the HIV accessory genes counteracted the CTL response. And in this experiment, we um, infected primary T cells either with a wild-type HIV that expressed a marker protein, placental alkaline phosphatase, um, or with an HIV that had been mutated in one of the accessory um, open reading frames, in this case, NEF. And then we did flow cytometry to score the percentage of cells that was infected either when the uh, cells were incubated alone or in the presence of um, an anti-HIV CTL clone directed against a GAG epitope. In the case of um, wild type, um, you can see a nice population of PLAT positive cells, and this is the infected subset. And because we also stained with an antibody to MHC class 1, we can look at the MHC1 expression on the cells. And it's easy to see that the PLAT positive cells have low MHC class 1 expression compared with um, the uninfected cells in the same culture. And um, following CTL recognition, this population of cells is preserved. And this is a, a four-hour incubation, relatively short. But these cells um, are, are not particularly susceptible to CTL recognition and lysis. By contrast, in the absence of NEF, the PLAT positive cells express normal levels of class 1 compared to uninfected cells in the same culture. And following incubation with CTLs, you can see the CTLs very effectively um, eradicated the infected cells from the culture. And this was an experiment that I did um, quite a while ago when I was a postdoctoral fellow in David Baltimore's lab. But I took this result with me when I established my own lab at the University of Michigan. And a series of graduate students and postdocs uh, worked on understanding exactly how NEF disrupts MHC1 expression and um, evades CTL recognition. So this is a schematic representation showing the trans-Golgi network and the surface of the cell. In an uninfected cell, um, MHC class 1 molecule uh, has picked up a antigen um, either derived from cellular proteins or if it's an infected cell um, from the pathogen.
And it, it's picked up um, the antigen in the ER and makes its way through the trans-Golgi network and out to the cell surface where it displays its antigen. But in a NAF-expressing cell, um, what Matt Casper, a graduate student in my lab, showed was that the MHC class 1 molecule doesn't make it from the trans-Golgi network and out to the cell surface. It um, gets stuck in the trans-Golgi network. And as was shown by Jeremiah Roth, another graduate student in the lab, um, the MHC class 1 molecule is rerouted into the endolysosomal pathway and is degraded at an accelerated rate. And Maya Williams, a third graduate student in the lab, uh, demonstrated through um, immunoprecipitation that MHC class 1 co-precipitates with NAF um, in NAF-expressing cells and that it's the cytoplasmic tail domain of MHC class 1 that's important for this interaction. And this makes a lot of sense because NAF is a cytoplasmic protein that interacts with the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane through a meristal group. <clears throat> um, interestingly, Matt Casper also showed that class 1 that's already present on the cell surface at the time of infection is actually not targeted by NAF because it's phosphorylated on its cytoplasmic tail and NAF doesn't bind it very well. And we think that this old class 1, which harbors cellular peptide antigens, is actually protective against natural killer cell recognition because natural killer cells recognize cells with low class 1. And so it's, it's in the virus's interest to preserve the older class 1 molecules that are presenting cellular antigens. And so we think that's why it's, it's not targeted by NAF. And I, and I should mention that all of the studies that we have done um, have been done in T cell lines or in primary T cells. And that's because Matt showed very elegantly in direct comparison studies that class 1 trafficking is different in HeLa cell lines and 293 cell lines as compared with T cells. And as a result of that differential trafficking, uh, NEF behaves differently. And so to get the right mechanism and the right target cell of HIV, you actually have to use the right cell type. Okay, so um, we then became interested in understanding whether there were any cellular cofactors of NEF that were important for targeting class 1 into the endolysosomal pathway. And to do this, we had to learn a little bit about normal intracellular trafficking. And the way the cell moves proteins from the trans-Golgi network into the endolysosomal pathway normally is um, through the efforts of clathrin adapter proteins. And there's three main, main ones, adapter protein 1, adapter protein 2, and adapter protein 3, known as AP1, 2, and 3. AP1 and 3 act at the trans-Golgi network and bind to signals within cytoplasmic tail domains of cargo proteins, and then, together with clathrin, move those proteins into endosomes or lysosomes. AP2 does something similar on the cell surface to promote internalization of cargo. And beta-COP um, appears to uh, traffic a number of proteins directly from the endosome to the lysosome compartment. And so we, um, we asked whether any of these cellular trafficking pathways were involved in NEF-dependent class 1 trafficking. And so Jeremiah Roth did a lovely experiment in which he first asked whether um, any of the adapter proteins could be found in the NEF class 1 complex. And so this experiment, again, was done in T cells. Um, and he uh, infected the T cells with a virus that expressed NEF and then did a pull-down experiment with a monoclonal antibody against MHC class 1 HLA-A2, which is um, an allotype of the um, HLA-A MHC class 1 molecules. Um, and then he probed either with antibodies to AP1, AP3, or NEF. And he saw co-precipitation with subunits of AP1 and, of course, with NEF, um, but not AP3. And this was um, a very nicely controlled experiment because when he did the same IP in the absence of NEF, he was unable to detect AP1 immunoprecipitating with HLA-A2. And in NEF-expressing cells that did not express HLA-A2, uh, there was no co-precipitation of either molecule as expected. And so um, it seemed that there was a specific interaction between uh, class 1 and AP1 in NEF-expressing cells. <clears throat>
Um, but, but that didn't mean that AP1 was actually involved in the process. NEF is a multifunctional protein. It downmodulates other proteins, including CD4, the HIV receptor. And it may just be serendipitous that some of the NEF was uh, linked to AP1 in our class 1 pull downs. To, so to actually show that AP1 was required for NEF activity, Melinda Schaefer, a graduate student in my lab, um, made a series of lentiviral vectors containing shRNA cassettes directed to each of the adapter proteins that we thought might be involved in NEF's pathway. She transduced those into T cells and made transient lines that were knocked down either for AP1, AP2, AP3, or beta-COP, and showed that these knockdowns did, did not affect NEF expression levels. And so we would be able to uh, test these cells and see whether uh, silencing of these individual proteins affected class 1 downmodulation by NEF. So this is a flow cytometric analysis of MHC class 1 expression, either in the presence of NEF or in control cells. And what Melinda found was that knocking down AP1 dramatically reduced the ability of NEF to downmodulate class 1. And in contrast, knocking down AP2 and AP3 subunits did not affect NEF activity whereas knocking down beta-COP did reduce uh, downmodulation, but to a lesser extent. And in a, a rather detailed study um, that we've already published, uh, we go on to show that, that this particular role of beta-COP is indeed to target class one molecules from endosomes into lysosomes. Um, and I'm not going to have time today to, to talk more about that. But rather, because of some recent data, I'm going to focus more on the role of AP1 in class 1 downmodulation. So what is AP1? Um, AP1 is a heterotetrameric protein. Like the other adapter proteins, AP2 and AP3, it's comp composed of two heavy chains and two lighter chains, um, termed mu and sigma. And these are interesting molecules because they have two separable binding sites um, for signals. Um, and these are signals, again, found in cytoplasmic tails of target um, cargo. There's a tyrosine-based signal, which is found within the mu subunit. And then there's a dilucine-based signal, which is found at the interface between the sig sigma subunits and the larger subunits. Um, Interestingly, uh, NEF had previously been shown to have a canonical dilucine motif with an upstream acidic region that was known to bind clathrin adapters. But the problem with this for our model was that it was well known that if you mutate this dilucine motif within NEF, NEF could still downmodulate class 1 without a problem at all. It couldn't downmodulate CD4 anymore, but it could downmodulate class 1. So that was, that was a little worrisome. Um, but AP1 can also bind to tyrosine signals um, as long as there's a hydrophobic motif um, a couple amino acids away. And it was of interest to us that though NEF didn't have any interesting tyrosines within it, the MHC class 1 tail did. There's this tyrosine shown here, shown in red, but the only problem is that the alanine downstream of it is not hydrophobic enough to support AP1 binding which is why we probably don't see AP1 binding to class 1 in the absence of NEF. So Maya Williams um, tried to mutate the cytoplasmic tail to see whether it affected AP1 binding. The only problem was every mutation she made in the tail that affected AP1 binding also affected NEF binding. And so that was a problem uh, to, to make any progress. And so she did something rather clever, and I was a little nervous. I didn't think it was going to work. But she did it anyways, and she, what she did was she just fused NEF to the end of the class 1 cytoplasmic tail and nicely showed that this class 1 NEF fusion protein was able to pull down um, AP1, just like free NEF was able to do. And now she was able to mutate the tail and not worry about losing NEF binding and just focus on AP1. And when she did that, she confirmed that the dilucine motif within NEF was not required in the context of the class 1 tail for AP1 binding. But rather, when she mutated this tyrosine within the class 1 tail, she completely lost AP1 binding. And when she deleted the tail, she completely lost AP1 binding. And so it became quite clear that AP1 was actually interacting with class 1 and not NEF, which was surprising to us. <laughs> 
but very cool. <coughs> and so we came up with this model um, where class one uh, tyrosine uh, might be binding through the canonical tyrosine binding site within the AP1 mu1 subunit. And that though this wasn't naturally a signal for AP1, NEF was somehow stabilizing a weak signal. And um, to pursue that hypothesis that this tyrosine was using the canonical AP1 tyrosine binding pocket, Elizabeth Wunderlich in the lab made a mutation within the tyrosine binding pocket, which in AP2, a similar molecule, created a dominant negative mutant. And so Elizabeth tested this by, by taking the dominant negative mutant, again, putting it into T cells, and then infecting them with a NEF-expressing virus. And what she found was that compared to a cell line that just overexpressed the wild type AP1, the cell that expressed the AP1 dominant negative mutant completely blocked the ability of NEF to downmodulate class 1. And so that, that tyrosine binding site within AP1 was clearly very important. And it was specific to class 1 downmodulation. As I mentioned, NEF also downmodulates CD4. And overexpression of this mutant did nothing to disrupt NEF's ability to downmodulate CD4. And that's shown here, um, AP1 dominant negative blocking A2 downmodulation, but not affecting CD4 or NEF's effects on other surface molecules. Um, Elizabeth Wunderlich also went on to do more extensive mut mutation of the class 1 cytoplasmic tail and found that in addition to the tyrosine, there were two other amino acids downstream that were required for AP1 interaction. And so in the context of, of NEF, in any case, there's a very unusual AP1 binding site within the class 1 tail. And this made us wonder a little bit uh, how lucky NEF might be to serendipitously come upon this weak interaction between class 1 and AP1 that involves three separate amino acids. And it actually made us wonder whether maybe NEF wasn't really lucky so much as the fact that AP1 and class 1 might interact in some different context. And so, um, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But first, um, what I'm going to tell you about is that um, an recently another group, um, John Gotelli's lab in collaboration with a crystallographer at Yale, um, published this crystal structure. And what they used was that same HLA-A2 cytoplasmic tail fusion protein with NEF that they expressed in E. coli and purified the protein. And then they mixed it together with purified AP1 mu1 subunit and got crystals. And the really cool thing about this is shown here in green is, is the AP1 mu1 subunit. And here's the tyrosine binding pocket of AP1. And shown in peak, pink is the class 1 cytoplasmic tail. And here's that tyrosine I told you about, and you can see how it nicely fits within that class 1 tail when NEF is present. And here is NEF shown in blue, and this is a polyproline region that's required for class 1 downmodulation. And you can see it just sort of holding it in, the class 1 tails sitting in this groove formed between AP1 and NEF. And here's that alanine, which I told you wasn't hydrophobic enough to support AP1 binding alone. And you can see how it doesn't really fit here in this hydrophobic pocket. Um, it, it's shown in closer uh, close-up view here. It, it's not really fitting in this pocket, whereas this more hydrophobic, bigger leucine molecule fits quite nicely. And so this was just really lovely to see um, because we had all this biochemical data and models and everything. But it just uh, it's so nice to see it, and it's really true that uh, this seems to be the way that class one is interacting with AP1 and stabilized by NAF. So um, to summarize. Um, the HIV-NEF protein promotes persistence by disrupting antigen presentation. NEF stabilizes a weak interaction between class 1 and a clathrin adapter protein AP1. And so we hope that compounds that disrupt this interaction will have therapeutic potential. And we're, we're currently uh, collaborating with David Sherman um, at the University of Michigan looking at some natural extracts that seem to have some uh, interesting activities in this regard. But we do pause a bit because, as I mentioned, we wonder whether there might be a natural role for the class 1 AP1 interaction that might be detrimental if inhibited. And um, to pursue that possibility, 
that perhaps there is a natural context through which AP1 and Class 1 interact. Um, Deanna Culpa, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, began to look at macrophages and dendritic cells. And she looked at these antigen presenting cells for class 1 AP1 interactions because these cell types are known to have alternative pathways for class 1. All nucleated cells have class 1 and express endogenous antigens that are loaded up with class 1 in the ER. But in addition to this pathway, antigen presenting cells have um, an additional pathway termed cross presentation. And with cross presentation, antigens are taken up uh, through the process of phagocytosis and directed to class one through a unique pathway. And so we asked whether uh, macrophages might have a capacity to, um, to have AP1 bind class one. And so Deanna did an immunoprecipitation with HLA-A2 and indeed found in macrophages that AP1 co-precipitated. And this was different from what we observed in T cells. And when she mutated the tyrosine in the class one cytoplasmic tail, uh, this interaction went away. And so then she asked whether this interaction was uh, functional in a cross presentation assay. And she developed an assay in a, in a macrophage cell line whereby she could detect cross presentation of an ovalbumin epitope. And um, in this assay, there's an antibody that de detects um, the ovalbumin epitope synfecal in association uh, with class one. And you can see here in this microscope that there's some red staining indicative of cross presentation. When these same cells overexpress the tyrosine binding pocket mutant that I told you about in AP1 that can't bind to signals, cross presentation went away. And that's quantified here. And then Deanna went on to do a lot of controls to show that TBPM wasn't disrupting antigen uptake, and it wasn't reducing class one expression on the cell surface. In fact, class one on the surface was able to bind synthetic peptide fine, but it had a defect apparently in its ability to present um, processed protein um, from, uh, from the media. So it seemed to be specific for cross presentation. Um, she then went on to try to provide even more evidence that this was a highly specific uh, requirement for AP1. And one thing that was really helpful in that regard is that humans express um, three types of class one, HLA-A and HLA-B, as well as HLA-C. And the tyrosine in the cytoplasmic tail is highly conserved um, amongst all HLA-A and HLA-B molecules. But in HLA-C, there's no tyrosine, there's a cysteine. And it turns out that HLA-C molecules are resistant to NEF. They're not downmodulated. And that's actually really important. Um, Mary Carrington at the NIH has some recent data uh, showing that individuals who have naturally high levels of HLA-C are protected in HIV disease. <laughs> so um, based on our cross-presentation assay and the requirement for the tyrosine for AP1, we became interested in asking whether HLA-C cross-presented at all, and if it did, whether it would require AP1. So De Deanna, again, did a cross-presentation assay, and indeed was able to detect cross-presentation um, by molecules containing an HLA-C tail. But different to the HLA-A2 uh, containing molecules, uh, cross-presentation was not inhibited by the AP1 dominant negative mutant. And so um, these analyses have allowed us to propose a model for cross-presentation pathway that utilizes the AP1 binding to the tyrosine signal in class one. In this model, um, down here is showed the endogenous class one pathway where peptides are picked up in the ER and trafficked into the Golgi apparatus. But in antigen presenting cells that are activated for cross-presentation, we propose that something happens here whereby the tyrosine signal in the cytoplasmic tail is activated so that the tyrosine can bind to AP1. And this signal could be a NEF-like protein. It could be a post-translational modification of the class 1 tail. Anything to stabilize this weak interaction between AP1 and the tyrosine signal. And now the class 1 molecule is able to go to an antigen presentation compartment where it picks up exogenous antigens and presents them 
as part of a cross-presentation pathway. So to summarize, um, there appears to be a natural interaction between AP1 and class 1 that's involved in antigen cross-presentation. And from a practical standpoint, having this assay in the lab is useful because we'll be able to take any compounds we find that inhibit NEF activity and make sure that they don't also inhibit cross-presentation. OK, so I've talked to you a little bit about um, the CTL response and how um, the HIV NEF protein helps HIV avert it by downmodulating class 1. But many of you probably know, and I mentioned this earlier in my talk, that natural killer cells are specifically geared to find cells that lack class 1, and in the presence of activating ligands, release perforins and granzymes that lead to death of cells with no class 1. Um, and uh, HIV-infected cells don't have no class 1. They have some class 1. Um, and in this case, um, whether or not natural killer cells will recognize cells with just low class 1 is often determined by a balance of signals between whatever inhibitory signal they get from the class 1 molecules plus any activating signal they get from activating ligands. Now, activating ligands are a little bit complex. They're upregulated on virally infected cells and on other types of cells um, that have undergone DNA damage um, or other stresses like heat shock and oxidative stress. And so when the stressed cell upregulates the activating ligand, this helps the natural killer cell find it and eradicate it. So we became interested in, in determining whether the balance between the low class 1 and any activating ligands that might be upregulated would be sufficient to trigger lysis of HIV-infected cells by natural killer cells. And these experiments were done by Jason Norman, a graduate student in the lab. And they're sort of similar to the ones I showed way at the beginning with CTLs, except now we're using NK cells. So again, we infect primary T cells within HIV, and this is an HIV that expresses GFP. And then we incubate the cells, um, either minus or plus autologous natural killer cells, harvest the cells, stain for class 1, and look for GFP positive cells as a marker of infection. And in this case, what we observed with wild type virus um, is that there was a little bit of lysis from the autologous NK cells, but the NK cells certainly didn't eradicate the virally infected cells from the culture. Um, and then what we did was we took an HIV and we inserted an NK activating ligand inside the HIV, so all the infected cells had more activating ligand. And in this case, um, all of the virally infected cells essentially were gone. And so our conclusion from this is that expression of NK activating ligands is relatively limited um, on HIV infected cells and their expression is not adequate to leave lead to a highly efficient uh, lysis by autologous NK cells. So Jason went on to ask whether one of the viral accessory proteins might be involved in modul modulating the activity of NK activating ligands. And so again, he tested viruses that had mutations in each of the accessory proteins. And he scored cells that were infected for NK G2D activating ligand expression. And one thing that was hard um, about this project was he had to use, and we do this anyways often, but he had to use primary T cells um, because all of the cell lines that we tested had constitutively high NK activating ligand expression. And so HIV did nothing to increase them anymore. But primary cells naturally express no or very low NK activating ligands, as you'd expect. And infection uh, led to an upregulation. But um, the donor, the effect varied somewhat dramatically by donor. And so he had to do a lot of experiments to achieve consistent trends. Here you can see that this donor only upregulated 1.5 fold with infection, whereas this one was 5.5 fold. So th these were hard experiments. But nevertheless, um, he tested all of the accessory protein mutants that we generated. And he, he did observe some interesting things. Um, for one thing, all of the ligand upregulation that he observed 
completely dependent upon VPR expression. So this is a bit counterintuitive that VPR of viral protein leads to upregulation of ligands. And so whatever VPR is doing, that seems to be a consequence of it. Additionally, we observed a modest increase in ligand expression when we got rid of VIF and NEF. And this modest effect had been previously reported in the case of NEF, but not VIF. And so we focused on, on VIF to see whether that was real or not. And to see if it was real, Jason um, asked whether removing VIF sensitized the infected cells to autologous NK-mediated lysis. And indeed, in a series of donors, he consistently observed that the mutant virus survived less well in the presence of NK cells compared with wild-type virus. And so we concluded that though the effect was modest, it seemed to be um, relevant and important to study. So to get an idea of how VIF might um, counteract NK ligand upregulation, we, uh, we thought a little bit about what VIF does. And it's well known that VIF binds to ABOBEC 3G and promotes its degradation. ABOBEC 3G is acitidine deaminase that converts citidine to uracil in single-stranded DNA. Um, and in the absence of VIF, ABOBEC attacks the incoming HIV first-strand DNA and induces hypermutation and inhibits reverse transcription. So Jason wanted to know whether the interaction between VIF and ABOBEC was important for VIF's effects on NK ligands. And so he made an HIV that had a point mutation in VIF, and this mutant VIF did not interact with ABOBEC. We knew that from the literature. And what he found was that the mutant VIF acted like the VIF null, um, in that it also did not uh, downmodulate ligands. And so this pointed to ABOBEC as being an important factor in ligand upregulation. And so Jason began to look at ABOBEC expression amongst his donors. And one thing that we really observed was a wide variety of ABOBEC expression levels in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells that we tested. And even in the absence of infection, um, that higher levels of ABOBEC tended to lead to higher expression of ligands. But this was increased further with expression, oh, uh, with HIV infection. Um, and uh, donors with high initial ABOBEC levels tended to have higher upregulation of ligand. And so this um, correlation helped us to implicate ABOBEC 3G and ligand upregulation. And the role of VIF was to counteract ABOBEC, which in turn counteracted ligand upregulation. So how do we understand that ABOBEC might uh, induce NKG2D ligand expression. Well, I'm, I, I told you that ABOBEC um, converts cytosines to uracils, and when cells detect uracil within their DNA, they try to remove it. And they remove it with uracil glycosylases, like UNG2, in human cells. And this a, a basic site then becomes a target for endonucleases, which create DNA strand breaks, which are then repaired by repair polymerases. Well, when hyperuracilation happens, as in the case of an incoming uh, viral molecule that's attacked by ABOBEC, uh, this creates many uh, DNA strand breaks, which is well known to activate the DNA damage response. And as shown by David Rollet, the DNA damage response is well known to activate or upregulate NKG2D ligands. And so Jason went on to show that, in fact, in the absence of VIF, um, the DNA damage response was um, activated. And so this is an explanation, we think, for why ABOBEC expression leads to higher ligand expression. But there was still another piece of the puzzle that we didn't understand, because all of the upregulation that we observe in the absence of VIF goes away in the absence of VPR. VPR is required for ligand upregulation. So why is that? So what do we know about VPR? Well, VPR is the most mysterious of all of the accessory proteins. People still don't entirely know what it does. But it, it is well understood that VPR binds to a uracil glycosylase on 2 And this uracil glycosylase could repair some of these incorporated uracils. And so we asked whether the interaction between VPR and on 2 was important for ligand upregulation. And so again, Jason made a virus 
um, with a VPR with a point mutation, and this point mutation abrogated VPR's ability to interact with Ung, and he observed that ligand upregulation was reduced uh, with this mutant, uh, not completely, but reduced. And so we think that part of the answer, at least, um, is that VPR uses Ung perhaps to re repair these uracil residues, um, but VPR also interacts with other host proteins involved in DNA repair, so there may be other pathways to accomplish the same goal that we didn't eliminate. Jason also did a hard experiment, which was to silence ONG2 in primary T cells by making a lentiviral vector that expressed an a SHRNA cassette target against ONG2, and he saw a reduction in ligand upregulation consistent with a role for ONG2 but um, we didn't achieve complete knockdown and there, again, was a partial result. So based on these results, um, we propose the following model. Um, in the absence of VIF, um, HIV releases its RNA into the cytoplasm, which is then reverse transcribed into first trans cDNA, which is targeted by APOBAC3G, converting cytosine to uracil residues. Uh, which leads to hypermutation and some inhibition of reverse transcription. If this template then makes it into the nucleus, it becomes a target for the vpr ung complex to facilitate rapid repair of the HIV template, which in turn activates the DNA damage response leading to NKG2 ligand upregulation. In the presence of VIF, ApoBAC3G is uh, targeted for degradation there is reduced incorporation of uracil, a reduced requirement for repair, and reduced activation of the DNA damage response, and reduced ligand upregulation. And so all of these studies were done in T cells. And the leap that we're trying to make now is trying to better understand the role of VPR in macrophages. And that's what these two guys are working on, Mike Mashaba and David Collins, two other graduate students in my lab. Um, macrophages are different. They don't divide. They don't have um, these DNA damage molecules. And ligand upregulation is really different in macrophages. And uh, it's important to understand um, the connection between uracil and viral spread in macrophages because the biggest phenotype for VPR occurs in macrophages. And so this, this has yielded some really interesting results um, um, that I'm not going to have time to go into today. Okay, so in the, in the final few minutes, I'm going to just give you a very brief inter introduction to my session talk um, later today. So I've, I've told you a little bit about the molecular mechanisms through which HIV is able to counter um, the innate and adaptive immune responses. <clears throat> um, and so there's lots of reasons why the immune system doesn't work to control HIV, some of the ones that I've shown you today and, and many others that other uh, investigators have reported. But we have really good drugs, and why don't these drugs just cure disease? They're able to bring the virus down to undetectable loads for years and years, and yet when we stop the drugs, the virus always comes back. And the, the main important point to understand is that all of the HIV drugs that we have right now target the virus particles. They inactivate the viral particles so they're no longer infectious, or they prevent reverse transcription and integration once they come into a new target cell. But none of the drugs target the cellular reservoirs that are producing the viruses. And once a cell has become infected, its, its lifetime is relatively short because the virus is fairly toxic to the cell. However, Sometimes um, after the virus has entered the cell and reverse transcribed its genome and integrated it into the host chromosome, the cellular transcription factors necessary for gene transcription aren't present in that cell. And this latent virus um, can sit there within the cell's genome for as long as that cell lives. And if the cell is very long lived or if the cell divides, the virus can persist for very long periods of time. And if cellular conditions change later on to favor viral transcription, this genome becomes activated to make more virus. So it's currently thought that long-lived latent reservoirs are really an important explanation for why drugs don't cure disease, and that we need to specifically target these latent reservoirs in order to cure disease. <clears throat> 
So what kinds of cell types can support latent reservoirs? Um, well, it's known that resting memory T cells are one example of a reservoir. Um, the mo most studies have been done on this reservoir, and the, the data is good. Sequences found in resting T cells can be shown to match uh, viremic blips um, that occur on therapy. And HIV can be isolated from resting memory T cells that are activated ex vivo. But there's also evidence for other HIV reservoirs. Um, some of the sequences found in the plasma um, in some studies haven't been able, uh, don't match any of the provirus found in T cells, macrophages, or dendritic cells. And many of these sequences that can't be found to match the T cells are clonal in nature, um, indicating that um, they're derived from the very same HIV sequence and not spread uh, by viral replication. So um, Chris Carter, um, an MSTP student in my lab, became interested in looking at other potential reservoirs. And because it was important to, live, to look for cells that were very long-lived, Chris focused on hematopoietic progenitor cells. And this was an interesting target because hematopoietic progenitor cells express HIV receptors CD4 and chemokine receptors. Um, hematopoietic progenitor cells can be identified through the markers CD34 and CD133. They're CD38 negative and they're also lineage negative. Um, it's important to note that um, hematopoietic progenitor cells are highly heterogeneous and though people think of stem cells right away, a bona fide stem cell is actually a really minor component of the CD34 positive population. And it's really hard to identify a stem cell as a stem cell. There's not real good surface markers for this. And functional studies are required in which you look at the capacity of the cell to form colonies in methylcellulose or to engraft in an immuno immunocompromised mouse model. Generally speaking in the lab, we group these cells together based on CD34 and CD133 expression. So we're looking at a mixture of cells that could be stem cells, but are more likely to be multipotent progenitors. Once maturation occurs, CD34 is downmodulated, CD38 is upregulated, and lineage markers are also upregulated. Whoops, went backwards. Sorry about that. So there's Chris Carter. Um, Chris um, did a simple experiment. He took uh, bone marrow progenitor cells and treated them uh, with HIV and then did flow cytometry to focus on the CD34 subset of these bone marrow progenitor cells that are partially purified in this experiment and ask whether they became GAG positive. And you can see that indeed 6% of the cells express GAG. And um, it was important to do controls here because sometimes GAG can stick nonspecifically to cells and so forth. So he showed that treatment of the cells with AZT, a reverse transcription inhibitor, dramatically reduced the staining of these cells. And moreover, um, the CD34 positive cells that became GAG positive were able to downmodulate MHC class 1 and so also expressed the NEF protein. So having shown that in vitro, um, HIV can infect hematopoietic progenitor cells. Um, uh, Chris wanted to know whether they could also support a latent infection. And so he used the fact that HIV, when it actively infects hematopoietic progenitor cells, um, it, it kills them. They don't stay around very long in culture to de deplete the actively infected cells. So by about a week in culture, all the actively infected cells are gone. He then added some cytokines, um, GM, CSF, and TNF-alpha, to induce myeloid differentiation. And he saw a resurgence of GAG expression, shown here, um, supporting um, the uh, idea that these hematopoietic progenitor cells can not only support an active infection, but also a latent infection. So to summarize this section of the talk, um, uh, we've generated quite a bit of evidence now that hematopoietic progenitor cells can support both an active and a latent infection, and that cytokines that induce myeloid differentiation reactivate latent HIV. And come to my next talk to learn more about infection of HPCs in patients and to learn about the mechanism of latency in hematopoietic progenitor cells.
So I, I tried to acknowledge the people who did the experiments as I went along. Um, and I'd just like to take a minute to thank the NIH and Burroughs Welcome and the University of Michigan for their um, uh, financial support, which was, of course, essential to complete all these studies. And that, uh, with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions.